Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Eric Hartnett. I am the Director of Electronic Resources at Texas A&M University and the host for today's event. Our forum today is, yes, I'll have one of those, Acquisitions in Folio. Today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all questions submitted, and we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Use the Q&A box within Zoom to enter questions and comments as they come to you. The speakers will address the questions at the end of the presentation. If you like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org. Our speakers today are Kristen Martin, Director of Technical Services at the University of Chicago, Anne-Marie Bro, Vice President of Workflow Services Product Management with EBSCO, and Dennis Bridges, Chief Design Officer with Stax. So with that, I will turn things over to Kristen. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. So I have the easy job here of basically providing a bit of background and overview on the work that's been happening in Folio in the areas of resource management and acquisitions. So thank you for coming to, yes, I'll have one of those, acquisitions in Folio. So we've been introduced, so I'm not gonna do that again, but I'm gonna provide you to a short introduction to the resource management special interest group or if you're already familiar with acronyms that are common in Folio, the SIG. So here's our basic charge for resource management. Um, our job is to work with developers to define essential functions for acquiring and managing all types of materials. So this includes acquisitions, like the ordering, invoicing, financial management, licensing, access and authentication, evaluation through user statistics or other mechanisms, and uh, reporting within kind of an acquisitions realm. As part of this, we're going to determine the appropriate representations of the relationships between the resources and mechanisms and workflows that are needed to support these functions. Some of our additional responsibilities are to evaluate the potential for applications that can support selection, decision making, and analysis, and identifying and, and advising developers on the coordination needed between the operations managed by the resource management SIG and then other functions happening within Folio, specifically mentioned here resource management and resource access is two very large um, common functionalities needed in libraries. We also advise developers on the interactions that are needed between libraries, vendors, and other parties to have successful resource management. And we do our best to ensure that our current work is not limiting future innovation. So it's a fairly large charge and we have um, broken up our work into some subgroups. These are the current active subgroups within resource management. Um, and some of these subgroups actually are working on things that go across all of Folio, but came out of ideas that were seeded within the resource management SIG. The first of which being the tag subgroup, ways to provide um, some lightweight identification and quick tagging of different types of documents or items within Folio. We also have a workflow and to do app subgroup, which again is kind of a cross app development, but helping ways to support libraries in their processes and make sure that things don't get lost, that items, that people can really use their ILS to keep track of their work as opposed to creating shadow systems outside of it. We have the E holding subgroup, uh, whose main goal is to integrate knowledge bases into Folio. Uh, we have an electronic resources management subgroup relatively recently formed that's developing more full-fledged ERM functionality, looking at kind of packages, platforms, license management, and all these things obviously are going to interact with each other. And then we have the acquisition subgroup, which has been active since, um, gosh, it's been over a year. And that's where we're going to be focusing on today um, is the work that's been done by this group and along with Stacks.
Hi, so this is Anne Marie, and I'll talk for just a slide or two and then turn it over to Dennis. Um, you can see our subgroup. I was counting up our meetings last night. Um, we started meeting in earnest last August. We've had between 65 and 70 meetings um, since then. And so we range from a couple a week to four, uh, a few times five a week if things were really busy. And we have three, what, what, uh, we tend to call SMEs in Folio, the subject matter experts. So John and Steve are uh, focused on monographs. George is, is mostly focused on electronic resources. Everyone has extensive acquisitions experience. And so um, basically keeping us all honest uh, as we try to work through all the bits and pieces of acquisitions. Uh, Dennis is going to talk more about the, the folks from Stacks, but Dennis is our uh, main product owner who is uh, c keeping all of the work organized and is responsible for writing the specifications and being the go-between between our small group and the developers and the UI folks and uh, and representing the work that the, that the acquisition subgroup is doing to the SIG and to other external communities. In my role, I've been an acquisitions librarian for a long time and my focus for the last 15 years or so has been acquisitions workflows for monographs, how they connect between vendors and library systems. So um, my piece uh, kind of works heavily in that regard in terms of the workflow integrations. And then Harry Kaplanian uh, uh, joins us when he can, since this is a large, pretty intricate piece of folio that touches uh, most of the other pieces of folio. Uh, maybe users would be about the only piece it wouldn't touch at this moment. Um, Harry will sit in with us sometimes when he has time. And actually, sorry, I should say one more thing, Dennis, I forgot. Um, I, we do meet quite a bit. We don't have every acquisition specialty uh, represented on the group. So when we've talked about things that we didn't feel like we were uh, uh, comfortable enough with, we tend to bring in other specialists. So when we were talking about check-in or subscription renewals, we would bring in uh, somebody typically from one of these libraries that, that we already have, so Auburn or Texas A&M or Boulder, um, to to talk about what that check-in process is like or what the subscription renewal process is. And then also my colleague, Ann Campbell, uh, from the subscription side of EBSCO uh, has joined us when we've talked about some things that are unique to subscriptions. So just wanted to make sure folks know that we don't, um, we don't assume we know everything. We try to bring in other folks as we need to. All right, now it's yours, Dennis. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much, Anne-Marie. Uh, and welcome everyone, thank you so much for joining us here today to take a look at all the different aspects of acquisitions that we've been working on and get a bit of an update. Maybe it's your first time seeing it, maybe you've seen it before, and hopefully there's um, enough information here to make everyone happy with uh, the time they're spending. So just a quick note on our team, the Stacks team. So I'm actually, uh, member of Stacks Inc. and we, we build a content management system basically that's built specifically for libraries. But we're involved in the Folio project and there are a handful of us that are really active in the community and those are the people that you're seeing here. So myself, the, the product owner, enough's been said about me I think already. Uh, Kevin Horick, who is actually our user experience designer uh, and creative director of Stacks. He is also heavily involved here in working on the design of Folio from our perspective, the design of our module, uh, modules and the user experience of our modules. And we've got Walid Agoon, who is our lead backend developer, who also has a lot of experience in mobile. We're very lucky to have this guy uh, helping us work through these modules. And of course, Arvind Andrian as well, who's our lead front end, who's actually implementing a lot of that design work in the frameworks that Folio provides. So these guys are actually hands-on doing all the work in the platform. And you see a couple of photos there of our office. We're actually in Western Canada. We're on mountain time, which becomes a very important thing when you're talking to people all over the world. So welcome to all of you, whether it's 
morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, thanks for joining us. The next thing I'm going to mention, uh, the format here of our presentation from this point on, we are hoping to give you a very reasonable perspective, let's say, of all of the modules that we're working on that make up what we call acquisitions at the moment, or what we refer to as acquisitions in Folio. And I'm, I'm condensed a lot of information, a lot of design work, a lot of development work into uh, a relatively short presentation here because we, we really do want it to be engaging uh, and interactive. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask those questions. I'm going to try and cover as much as I can going through the slides and the screenshots that we have. And then I will give you a little demonstration of the actual software that's working. Um, and we may point you to a location where you can potentially play with it on your own as well. So this is, these modules, these six modules are what make up acquisitions at the moment. We have the vendor module, a receiving module, an orders module, invoicing, finance, and credits. And so these six things are what we're going to go through at a high level in the next number of slides. And I'm going to talk about how they, what they allow you to do and how they interact with each other. And that will all sort of tie together into what we refer to as acquisitions and the functionality you get in, in acquisitions in Folio at the moment. I also just want to ask a question. Can you all see my cursor? Can someone validate that for me if I move it around? I can see your cursor. Okay. Yes. So if I'm pretending to be Vanna White a little bit here, it's actually going to be useful. Because <laughs> uh, I may point out a few things in our mockups. So the first module we're going to talk about uh, is the vendors module. And this is where we're able to, this area of, of the folio interface, if you've seen the folio interface before, you'll know that in general there, there are a number of icons in the top right hand corner that allow you to select different modules. And so when you select the vendors module, what you're able to do is add new vendor records to your system. So these records are created manually. And once you've populated your system with vendor records or potentially imported a handful of vendor records from another system, you're then able to search through them, filter through them in the vendors module uh, or the vendor app, we might call it. Um, and these vendor records for the, for the most part, carry preferences and defaults that will help us build orders and manage invoices and receiving um, and interaction, system level interactions with those other vendors. So, and this is of course going to evolve, but at a high level, what you see in a vendor record, uh, a brief summary, contact information, information about EDI, information about agreements, and all kinds of different things. And we're gonna look at this in a little more detail when we actually take a look at the piece of software. But what you see here on the right hand side, I'll just point out is the vendor record that you've selected, the information comes up uh, or slides in from the right hand side of the screen. Uh, and you're able to search and filter using this area over here. And if you've looked a little bit at Folio already, this format is probably very familiar to you. Okay, so once we have a vendor in the system, or once we've created vendors in the system, uh, probably our lo next logical concern with respect to acquisitions is starting to build some orders. And in Folio, you actually build purchase orders and purchase order lines. So we have this concept of a purchase order that may have only one purchase order line, or it may have many purchase order lines. And so what we see on the right hand side of the screen here in the screenshot, you see a bit of a hierarchy represented in this uh, list where we can quickly identify our different purchase orders. So a purchase order at the top and then purchase order lines within that. And again, when we look at the interface, you can actually see that the purchase order contains some summary information. Um, you know, when was this purchase order created? When was it sent? Potentially who is it assigned to? what vendor is it associated with, and we pull a bunch of information from there. 
you know, what is the preferred currency of this vendor and so on, a lot of that different information. Also, there's an area here that tells you a brief summary of what activity has gone on with respect to this order, because there could be multiple payments associated with an order and so on and so forth. It's gonna show us, uh, potentially show us a distribution of payment because our orders could be, the value of our orders can be distributed across different funds. So that's some of what you're seeing in the screenshot here. We could potentially have a percentage of this order that's being paid by different funds. And a little information about our total price. From here, we can send the order if the order has been sent. Uh, records are created in inventory for things that we order that we do not yet own, of course, right? Um, so there's an interaction between the orders module and the inventory module as we are creating and sending uh, these orders to acquire materials. And you see a little color representation here. I'll, I'll maybe just mention that briefly. In different aspects of our design, we're trying to leverage um, different ways of indicating things. So color obviously is an important part of that. Now, there are limitations to color because not everyone sees color the same way. Um, but some of the idea here is that these colors may represent and probably a uh, shape or an object associated with that color eventually. Uh, will re we'll represent the state of that purchase order and that purchase order line. So potentially yellow means um, that this purchase order line is, is not yet received, uh, but it has been sent. Whereas orange might mean that it has been received, but not yet paid for um, or invoiced. Um, and whereas green might mean fulfilled, red might mean canceled and so on. So there will be some visual representation of the status of these things to help the user organize, manage their purchase orders and purchase order lines more easily. So I wanted to show just a small diagram here, a quick uh, workflow diagram that, that describes a little bit about the process of ordering something uh, and having that be represented in inventory so that we can have an item status associated with it as well uh, as we are receiving and so on. So you can see fairly simple diagram here. We create an order or we import an order from another system, uh, which creates purchase orders and purchase order lines or potentially a purchase order and a purchase order line. Once we're satisfied with the details of that purchase order, we send that purchase order and there will be, and there are different methods that that can be done, uh, different ways that can be done through EDI or actually printing and physically sending that. We then, the system will decide, are these materials being ordered electronic? Are they physical? They could also be both. For electronic items, uh, we need to create two things at a minimum in inventory. We need an instance and a holding. And I don't want to get into too much detail with respect to inventory unless we have specific questions about it. We can answer what we can. Um, but those folks are sort of another group that organized this. But the instance and the holding, if you've been exposed to some of this, will hold the necessary details that we need or, or that we want at a minimum for an electronic to represent an electronic item. You have the ability when creating an order to decide whether you'd like an actual item record to represent that electronic resource or not. So depending on whether you said yes or no to that, uh, we would create an item record as well in that hierarchy in inventory and mark the status accordingly. For physical things, we are always creating an instance, a holding and an item. And once we've created the item record again, we would mark that item status is on order. We would then potentially be receiving one or more quantities of that item. Uh, and then adding a barcode to that record in inventory so we can keep track of those things, marking their status as received. Uh, and then probably that workflow is picked up by uh, folks in other areas of the library, right? Whether that be cataloging, circulation, et cetera. So this is the, the very quick summary of the interaction between 
our orders module, when you actually create something and press send this order, or that order is sent automatically, uh, what's gonna happen essentially in the system to help facilitate the acquisition of those materials. Just to show you a little of that interface of receiving now that we've created or made our, created our order, sent our order, uh, this, this receiving area, once order becomes available and you can access receiving from orders or invoices. Let's say you came to this receive items area from an invoice, you would see only the items on this or in this table uh, that you see on that invoice. Whereas if you came from the purchase order itself, you would see all of the items associated with that purchase order that could potentially be received in here available to be received. So trying to streamline that experience once again. We're then indicating which items we're receiving, either receiving all or only receiving a certain quantity of each item, which would take us to another screen uh, or potentially just a, a small pop-up that allows us to input the barcode, specify the location, uh, details for those actual physical things now that these units or pieces are becoming, um, you know, are actually going to be physically represented in our system moving forward. We also have a history of receiving that we can look at, we can edit and modify as well if need be. Okay. The other side of receiving or the other aspect of receiving where we're dealing with items that we've, we've ordered that we may be receiving many pieces of uh, at a certain interval or over a certain period of time in the future. And a lot of systems, there's an area like this. And at the moment we're calling this or we're referring to this as check-in. Uh, and there has been a lot of discussion about that. I'm sure there will continue to be. But the idea here, this area that looks very similar to receiving is actually showing us or outlining, it's an area where we can outline what issues, for example, or volumes that we're expecting to receive in the future or expecting to, I should say, check in uh, in the future. And so a similar process here where once we've actually checked in that piece, um, we're potentially identifying it in the barcode as well or updating uh, the record that represents it in inventory. And we once again have the ability to review our history uh, for this particular check-in and we can edit or you know correct mistakes that have been made not that we ever make mistakes but um, we can also add specific pieces or maintain a pattern is the idea here so you can maintain a, a sort of predictive pattern of your expected um, pieces now that we have received an item we've ordered, we've received an item, we need to pay for it. And this, what we're looking at on the right hand side of the, of the slide is an example of an invoice or an invoice record. Uh, and you can see very similar layout to the way that we're interacting with purchase orders or vendors and so on. This is a component that is shared amongst many of the modules, users included and inventory uh, in Folio. So we see it a lot, but we're able to filter through or search for and find invoices based on details of that invoice. So maybe it's something that needs to be paid based on a certain time frame. Uh, just invoices that have not been paid yet, invoices that are due very soon and so on. We can review the details of that invoice. Number of details here. One interesting aspect of this is we've acknowledged that there may be invoices or there may be payments that need to be made in different currencies. And we wanted to give you a way of quickly referencing the build currency versus your system's default currency. So what you see here where we have payment currency and we have invoice currency, right now they're both marked as the same thing. They could be different. Uh, potentially this invoice was actually received uh, and it's in euros. And so 
these are actual buttons or toggles that will allow you to change the values you see on your invoice based on the actual invoice currency that the system was you know, given. The system was told we're being invoiced in euros here, but we have the payment currency. Well, this is essentially either the currency that we intend to pay in or the currency of our system, our default currency, where we're able to see those values represented to give us a better idea of you know, what this really is going to cost us. A couple of other important things about the invoicing screen that you see here, is the table or what we would see as a number of different invoice lines potentially. This table is a common element that we're gonna see in acquisitions in different places. And you're gonna see it when I talk about transactions later on. But this table uh, actually allows you to show or hide specific columns. So if you're not finding the information here, you're not seeing the information immediately that you want to see on the invoice with respect to a specific invoice line, you may be able to add or remove columns of information. So let's say you're, you're, you don't need to see the quantity for one reason or another, uh, or you want to just want to save space, you could uncheck that box and that's going to hide the column for quantity. Of course, it's still there. That information is still there, but it removes it from your view so that you can streamline uh, this thing, streamline this area, the invoicing area to, to really reflect the information that you'd like to see. And of course here we can reference quickly the distribution of payment because each of these invoice lines may be distributed. The payment of that line may be distributed across multiple funds and so on and so forth. So we have access to all that information uh, from this area. And when we actually process an invoice, so once we've received these items and or um, you know, reviewed the details of our invoice and made sure that all the totals are correct, we have the ability to process or uh, and essentially pay that invoice. And what happens when we process the invoice is that the system will generate transactions that impact the different budgets that you have in the system. And we'll talk about the finance area and hopefully that'll make this a little more clear later on. But essentially you're, you're creating a transaction and uh, that transaction is going to reconcile all of the values of your invoice with whatever values were encumbered when you ordered that thing and allow you to basically pay for all of your materials. So let's talk a little bit more about payments, payments and credits, because we put these two things together oftentimes. And the, the, the really important thing here is that payments and credits will move values or amounts through your system. And there are different, uh, different types of transaction or there are different ways a transaction can exist, an amount associated with a transaction can exist. Uh, because those things will first be encumbered when we reserve funds by creating an order and sending an order. Those funds are encumbered and essentially reserved for that the payment of that thing, right, down the, down the road. Once we've received an invoice, those funds are marked as awaiting payment so that we can see that we actually have, you know, uh, a handful of, you know, dollars that are now awaiting payment, that we have invoices that have built up and we need to, you know, clear those invoices. They move from awaiting payment to eventually to expended. Um, and these payments and credits will affect that movement of values, that the movement of those about amounts. And if your folio system is connected to an external accounting system, these payments credits will also generate a voucher um, that can be sent to that system to let them to let that system know uh, what the amounts were, of course, and what accounts, what external accounts it affected. Uh, because 
We have the ability to indicate what external account a certain fund is associated with, and thus a certain payment associated with that, with that fund would be associated with. And so we can follow things down the chain and eventually get a receipt from that accounting system uh, that would let us know the date of the transaction, which would help us take care of you know, exchange rates, potentially uh, accurate, make our exchange rates more accurate and so on, understanding the, the date of the actual payment or transaction uh, from that external account so that we can res represent those va values as accurately as possible inside of Folio. So payments can, can be created manually as well. You're seeing here uh, from a fund record, we can manually create a payment. There's a button here for payment, for credit, for transfer, uh, where we can populate the details on our own. But as we're processing invoices, uh, the system is also gonna generate payments and credits for you to help reconcile all of these different values. I hope I didn't overcomplicate that, but to help explain the movement of those uh, amounts, we've got a little diagram here that shows basically the state that amounts can exist in. So, and maybe we should have done this after we have talked a little bit about the fund structures, but uh, hindsight's 2020. So hopefully this is still making sense uh, to all of you, or at least it comes together at the end. With respect to a fund, we need to allocate value there in order to be able to spend an amount or to create orders for an amount, we need to allocate money there first. Um, so there is a state for allocated value. Once allocated, those funds become available for spending. Um, once we create an order, so we've made an order here for $10, for example, uh, we've allocated 100 initially, which meant we have 100 available. We've made an order for 10, which means we only have 90 available now, and we have encumbered 10. If we were to process an invoice for $10, let's say that the amount is actually exactly what we ordered it, so it's exactly what we expected it to be. Isn't that convenient? Um, we can process that invoice for 10, which will move our value to awaiting payment. And the system in this case is generating an actual payment for that amount of $10. Um, and that is the voucher that may be sent out. So it's marked as expended. And our total expenditure exists here. Our total for awaiting payment, our total encumbered and so on. So this is, this is just a very high level summary of how amounts or values will move through the system depending on what's happening. So depending on whether you've just ordered that thing, uh, you've received your invoice and processed your invoice, or the system has created a payment voucher and been given a receipt or a confirmation that that payment was made, you know, that check was written and deposited and so on. And so um, these values will move according, accordingly. I could take a quick pause here. I just want to make sure that there aren't uh, questions maybe in the chat that I'm missing because I can't actually see the chat screen or anything like that. Are we still okay? So Dennis, we had a few. I've been trying to halfway answer them. Um, okay. There was a question about uh, exchange rates and international currencies. And mm -hmm. I, I think we've got the, the currency one covered. Um, for exchange rates, could you talk about the... Um, kind of the plans for either having an exchange rate in the system or doing lookups? Yeah, so there's been a lot of talk of, of this in, recent, in the recent past. And so uh, I can't really say that there's been a firm decision made on how we will handle uh, the exchange rate at the moment. The, the, front runner, and I'm going to do my best to explain this properly, would be that all of the values, if I back up quickly here, all of the values that exist inside of the system that impact very little, but just keeping track of things in the system and being able to understand where you're at on a daily basis, will be based on exchange rate from the current day. Let's say we've created and we've sent an order 
we are going to encumber funds. And if you were wanting to see the value of those funds in the systems currency, because let's say we're, we're making an order in euros and our default currency is Canadian or it's USD. Um, and we want to see that represented. It will be based on the day that the order was made. Uh, so we'll sort of freeze, freeze that, sorry, we'll sort of have a freeze frame for that value as things move through the system. When the, the actual payment is generated is when that amount will actually be converted into the system's default currency um, because we're assuming that those on that date that those funds have actually been expended. Now, that could mean two different things. If your system is not connected to an external accounting system, that date is likely just going to be the day that we press process invoice because a payment will immediately be generated uh, for that interaction or that transaction. Um, if it's connected to an external accounting system, the logic would be that the the exchange rate would be calculated based on the payment date that we receive back from that accounting system because uh, it was a check maybe dated a certain day or it was an electronic transfer that was made on a certain day and we're getting some kind of receipt from that system that says this is when that transaction was made. Maybe it actually gives us an exchange rate uh, but the thinking is at the very least um, you know, in the simplest of terms, we're using that date because that is the most accurate date for the exchange rate. So those funds will actually be converted and expended in your system's default currency. And I'll just mention, we did talk some about this in the small group when, um, when uh, Dennis was out last week. And one of the things that seemed common across a lot of the U.S. libraries is that uh, there's an attempt to minimize the amount of non-native currency, so non-U.S. currency in the case of a U.S. library, payments that are made. And the ways that they get around that is either to use PayPal or to use credit cards and then take whatever exchange the credit card has uh, decreed for that U.S. dollar amount. Um, we know that this is something we need to talk about more with international libraries that maybe do a lot more paying in multiple currencies instead of trying to stick with just one currency. So definitely something we want to talk about more in the RM SIG with folks. Yeah, and um, obviously one one that's very important question, not not a not necessarily an easy one to answer either. So. But I hope that clarifies what our approach is to date. Yeah, and I think there's some comments, um, um, some more about exchange rate. And just to, to address people's concern, we have members of the, uh, the resource management SIG from non-US libraries already on. Um, they're not participating in all of these acquisition subgroup discussions, but the, the acquisition subgroup is regularly taking back these types of items. So, uh, you know, the, the folio project is designed to be international in scope. So we're trying to make sure that, you know, that we do get that kind of feedback. Um, Cause I see there's a comment that um, from Melissa B here that they generally don't get the market exchange rate that they're generally having to pay somewhere yeah. above that. And yeah. so they might want to be able to configure the system based on that. Right. And we definitely are um, uh, mindful of that. Uh, most of my work the last 10 years or so has been with international non-US libraries and libraries that need to pay in currencies other than US dollars. So uh, definitely anything when it comes to money, we're trying to be very careful and very international oriented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but great questions. Um, there was one other question about um, integrating with external systems that I think maybe would be worth discussing before we go on. Um, and it was kind of wondering about if we're having support right now for any particular external systems 
whether they be um, mm -hmm. vendors or to any particular like university financial systems that might be more common than others. You want to take that one, Dennis, or you want? I can, sure. Uh, and maybe you can fill in the blanks with respect to other systems. But with when we're talking about a university financial systems, we haven't set a priority uh, for what integrations would be built first. Uh, so it's a little tough to answer that question. It's it's something that has definitely been flagged as important and necessary. Um, but in terms of what system and when, I think, you know, those priorities have yet to be set from my understanding, so. Right, and I think uh, part for the university financial systems, uh, that a lot's gonna depend on the early adopters and what systems they use, yeah. what connections they need, which will help to set the priorities. Um, for the vendor systems, we're intending to support uh, kind of standard integrations with a goal to making them more and more efficient. So uh, at a fact ordering and invoicing, um, moving data around in mark 9xx fields so whether that's order data or shelf ready data like call numbers and barcodes and copies and things um, and the order api that some libraries have where they can take an order that's been placed in an external vendor system and instead of moving a mark file around in a batch process have a real-time api connection to folio that would create a bib, uh, which would be in, uh, in most cases an instance in inventory and then create an order related to it. So those are what's intended. We are starting to work on the details for all of those um, in terms of the vendor connections. For the financial uh, system connections, it's gonna depend on the priorities. Yeah, well said. Um, we have a number of other questions, but, you know, I'm seeing one of the next questions has to do with um, kind of fiscal year and financial management. I know that's next um, in the presentation, so maybe we should go on for the moment and then we'll try to circle back to get um, additional questions. Yes, let's do that. That sounds great. Thank you. So next thing we're going to talk about is the actual finances module. Um, and the, that lead in about transactions, of course, is very relevant for finances because that's really where all these things are interacting. The finance module is where we have our fund structure. And the way that we've, you know, allow you to build, try to make this as flexible as possible while still providing, um, you know, mechanisms for organization and creating relationships and so on between the different types of record that you can create to, to in fact, build a structure um, for money or for amounts to exist and be controlled in your financial system here. So the first thing we're looking at is sort of the splash screen that intends to give you a high level uh, of what's going on in this finances app. And I'm actually going to come back to this in a second because first what I want to talk about are the different things that make up the structure. And those are, as you can see here, the elements include ledgers, funds, and budgets. And they do sort of exist in that hierarchy. So the ledger being uh, the overarching, uh, the all-encompassing sort of uh, element that ties funds together or that relates funds together to a fiscal year. So a ledger holds a fiscal year period. And so that ledger determines what the fiscal year period is for all of the funds on that ledger. Funds have budgets. So from a fund, we create a budget for that fiscal year. The fund will actually exist over many, many fiscal years. And, and so the budgets are where the amount really lives and, and what the transactions are being made against. So one budget to another, uh, or budgets actually 
creating, making payments and so on, and money leaving the system from the budget. So just an example of some structures that you could create uh, or a visualization of this ledger fund and budget. There are two different ones and I, and I, I want to emphasize the ability here to really make this whatever you'd like it to be. Um, that the ledger here is represented as the big square because really what the ledger defines is the period for the fiscal year. We then have funds and the funds are these circles or ovals uh, associated with the ledger and the funds will have multiple budgets. So the example here, you have a budget for 2016, a budget for 2017. The arrows that you see uh, or the double line arrows represent a relationship between funds. And so these relationships are what allow you to potentially create a hierarchical structure like the one we see here, where money in, in essence has to come in from the top and it filters its way through, it's distributed amongst funds, and then it is spent from budgets on purchases and so on. Okay, so in this scenario, we have the, the ledger again, we then have multiple funds and the relationship basically denotes that this particular fund can allocate money to certain funds. In this case, the aggregate fund can allocate money to materials. Materials can then allocate money to history or art. Um, and history can then make purchases. Uh, and history can also allocate money to American history or European history. And so you can see that the tree gets built and so on. Um, however, this is just one version of what that might look like. A second one, maybe much more, much more flat. So in this scenario, we can allocate money from the system to gifts, to facilities, to capitals, uh, capital projects, sorry. Uh, and all of these funds, so very flat structure in that, in that sense that we don't have to put all of our amounts into one place and then distribute them down the tree. Uh, in this case, we're adding money to these different funds uh, and these funds all have budgets and they're spending money in these different fiscal years, sort of more independently of each other, uh, but still within the same ledger. So. Both of these scenarios that you've seen, I guess one important thing to note is that there is only one ledger. However, that's not a restriction in Folio. You can have many ledgers and ledgers can have the same fiscal year period or they can even have different fiscal year periods. So potentially you've created a ledger for, you know, campus A, uh, which is in Europe, in, you have a ledger for campus B, which is somewhere in India, or I'm not sure, that maybe for one reason or another has a different fiscal year and manages you know, their own funds and budgets in that way. Uh, but they can still potentially interact with each other. So the system is, is intended to be very flexible and allow you to be either very hierarchical or much more flat. And I, I heard a word that is supposed to be the opposite of hierarchical, but I didn't want to use it today because I don't think it's actually found in the dictionary or maybe just not in the dictionary yet. But if you're curious about that, <laughs> Google the opposite of hierarchy <laughs> and you know, follow that down the path for, for a few minutes. Anyways, um, the finances module, just to come back now to this, what we're calling the finance dashboard. So we've seen that we have ledgers, funds, and budgets in the system, and hopefully you have a reasonable idea of how those things fit together, how they can potentially fit together. They don't need to have relationships, but they can have relationships. The one thing that is always going to exist is a fund is going to relate to a ledger, a budget is going to relate directly to a fund, a specific fund. And so in the dashboard here, and this is an area that is intended to give you a snapshot of your current situation. So I wanna emphasize that 
the word current because um, although this probably touches on reporting, resembles reporting, and makes you maybe think a little bit about reporting and reporting side of the software, the intention is actually to give you a more operational view, or, you know, daily operational view of where you are with different ledgers potentially, uh, with the system as a whole, and with certain funds within a ledger. So let me explain how this kind of works at a high level. The numbers that you see at the top are a reflection of the entire system until you've selected a ledger, okay? So this would show you the total amount you have allocated as a summary or a total of, of this column here. So all of my ledgers put together are my total allocation, my total unavailable. Uh, and unavailable could be encumbered funds, could be funds that are, sorry, it could be amounts. I should I'm try not to confuse those terms. Uh, amounts that are encumbered, amounts that are awaiting payment, amounts that are uh, potentially expended as well. So that's what is unavailable, of course. And then our total available is, is referring to, you know, the summary of this column here for all of our ledgers. Um, that represents the amount of money we have left to spend or encumber and so on. So when we select a ledger, we then see the, the box here in the bottom start to populate. And basically what's happening is we select a ledger and this box will fill with all of the funds that are associated with that ledger. And the totals at the bottom here will be a summary of the three columns in this box. So for all of the funds associated with ledger A, what is my current situation? What is my total allocated, my total unavailable, and my total available? Now I can also, of course, see the specific funds and a summary of those numbers as well in the box. And you may be wondering, well, what are these tags? Why do we have all these tags populating here? And the idea in the design now is because we're allowing you to add tags to funds and other things in the system, but in this case, really our concern is the tags associated with funds. Um, what you're able to do is select a ledger and that's going to pull up all of the funds associated with that ledger. It's also going to pull up all of the tags associated with one or more funds associated with that ledger. I hope I'm not really confusing things at this point, but what that allows you to do is now once you've selected a ledger, you can potentially select specific tags or more than one tag and that will also filter the box below. So it will filter it down even more. So you can get a more specific subset of the funds associated with ledger A, for example, and see their current totals. So I hope, and there may be some questions about that, but that, I hope that summarizes uh, reasonably well what this finance dashboard is all about. So it's intended really to give you the current snapshot for a subset of ledger fund and, and values associated with those things for the current fiscal year. So I'm gonna move forward once again. We're gonna jump forward a little bit more and just look quickly at uh, an example of a, of a fund record. So here we talked a little bit about uh, with respect to funds, relationships, <clears throat> currency, um, you know, different things that we have budgets associated with funds. So here we're looking at an actual fund record. And so in the finance area, we're able to say we want to see either ledgers, funds, budgets, and select one of those things and see the actual details associated with that. Uh, and here you can see we have this, you know, allow transfers from, allow transfer to, well, that's where we define those relationships between funds, for example. <clears throat> Excuse me, we can associate this fund with an external account, 
we talked a little bit about external accounts. Uh, it's identifying a currency based on the system's default currency. Um, and then we're seeing, sorry, we're seeing a summary of the current or the active budget for fiscal year 2017 below that. So we see allocated, we see unavailable and available. And we can, as I mentioned a little while ago, we can actually manually create credits, payments, transfers against that budget from the fund record. We can also add a new budget for this fund, maybe for fiscal year 2018, we can create a budget. The other thing we can do here is see transactions. So we can reference the transactions table from a fund record or with respect to a budget or an entire ledger potentially. Um, <clears throat> what this allows us to do is to take a look at all the transactions that have been happening and we see that the mock-up here um, in, in a similar format to what we talked about when we we're looking at the invoice record. So we had on an invoice record this table where you can show or hide columns. We have the same concept here. We can show or hide columns and then we can actually click on those specific columns and we can filter down. So, <clears throat> excuse me. For example, this column here is transaction type. So we can say uh, we only want to see rows that are a transaction type transfer, expenditure, credit, and donation, and so on. Uh, so we can change what we're filtering by, we can, or we can remove the filter uh, so we're not filtering by anything and we see everything we could possibly see in the table. But this allow you to uh, search through transactions and potentially export these transactions if you want to do some analysis in uh, you know, Excel or something like that. So things are heating up. Uh, this one final slide where we're looking at these uh, different aspects of the system and that is fiscal year rollover. So we now have ledgers, funds, and budgets in the system. We've created invoices, we've created orders, and we're, we're processing you know, invoices, we're sending orders, we're doing all this stuff in the system in the current fiscal year, and we need to get ready for next year. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we've, we've created a mechanism to help you manage fiscal year rollover. So what we're seeing here, something that we've linked to from the ledger. So it's a function that relates to a ledger specifically, and thus all of the funds associated with that ledger and all the budgets associated with those funds. And here, we're able to indicate that we are intending to roll over from this fiscal year to next fiscal year or whatever the you know, coming fiscal year might be for you. Maybe you've skipped a year, I don't know. Um, not likely to happen. And then we're identifying some characteristics that will help us automatically create new budgets, potentially, for our coming fiscal year. Will help us roll over values or amounts uh, that may still be encumbered or may be available. Um, we can even adjust what the allowable encumbrances and allowable expenditure will be for certain budgets. And we're doing this all based on the fund type. So at the moment, whatever fund types you have in your system, you would see them represented here with the following columns. So what we can do is we can choose, let's say for an example here, we'll just say for the fund type gifts, we have this gift fund and there's still an amount that's allocated in this fund. We want to roll over that allocation to next year. So let's say there were $100 in the gift fund. We want to roll over that allocation. So next year we're going to start with, regardless of what's still available in that gifts fund, we're going to start with $100 allocated once again, automatically. We could choose to even adjust that allocation slightly. 
if we wanted to uh, by percentage up or down. And we could also choose to not roll over that allocation. Maybe there's still $50 left in the gift fund. There's still $50 available. So all we'd like to do is roll over that available amount. And so our initial allocation for next fiscal year would actually be the $50 that was still available. So we're sort of saying we want to carry that over uh, into the next fiscal year so that we can spend it because it's a gift and it's not just going to disappear. We don't have to give it back to the state or something like that. We could also independently of all those other things, choose to roll over our encumbrances or not. So there may be certain values still encumbered if we haven't uh, canceled or uh, you know, finished processing these different orders and paying the, these different orders. Um, we may be rolling those orders over into the, the next fiscal year. We can make sure that the encumbrance actually goes along with them. Okay. And the last piece of this, we can adjust the allowable uh, encumbrance or expenditure for this specific type of fund. So we could say, um, and this is where things get a little bit complicated, might take a few minutes to explain, but uh, you could imagine that if we've allocated $100 to this particular fund or budget, um, and the allowable encumbrance is 100%, that means you're able to encumber up to $100 for that budget. Uh, if the allowable expenditure is $100 as well, that means you're allowed to process payments equaling up to $100 for that budget as well. So let's say the allowable encumbrance was 110%. And that would mean you've allocated $100 there. You can actually create orders and send orders that total up to $110. And when it comes to pay for those things, if the allowable expenditure is still only $100, or sorry, only 100%, which is $100, uh, you're going to have to negotiate or find some, uh, some margin there so that you can account for that extra $10 that you've encumbered. Uh, or you'd have to allocate an extra amount of money here so that you could <clears throat> actually pay for those things. So the system will allow you to set restrictions, although you certainly don't have to set restrictions on budgets and uh, the expenditure of the encumbrance. You could set it under 100% uh, for a specific part, you know, let's say until a certain time of year, and then you could go back uh, and edit it and increase it or, you know, uh, it's just giving you the ability to potentially uh, add restrictions uh, using that percentage. So the other things that we can do from here are quickly look at invoices. So we can check invoices that relate to our fiscal year rollover. So probably invoices that are not yet paid. Uh, we're going to see there when we click on check invoices, it's going to take us there and where we can make sure that all of the invoices based on the criteria that we've set for rollover uh, have been taken care of before we do this, or as we're doing this. By the same token, we can check orders. If there are orders associated with this rollover, we can go check on those. <clears throat> we also wanted to give you the ability to sweep budgets, and this term may be up for debate as well, but the idea of sweeping budgets in folio will mean um, we may have a series of, of budgets that still have amounts left over and there are only three months left in the year and it's pennies or it's a few dollars here, it's a few dollars there and we want to sweep all those amounts into a specific fund so that we can make a purchase from that specific fund with those remaining values. So we can squeeze every last dollar that we have or every last penny that we have in the system. And this mechanism will allow you to sweep many budgets into one. And that's just essentially going to create a transfer from all of those different budgets into the one budget that you've chosen. So once we've satis once we're satisfied with all of our settings here, we can roll over budgets. 
and that's the system is going to automatically create new budgets for all of those fund types that you've identified here. I'm guessing we may have a few questions on that, uh, but I hope I've given you a reasonable overview of what that might look like. The last thing that I want to talk about uh, before we do a quick demonstration is where we're at with respect to our analysis and design, development, and testing of all of these different modules. So this slide is really just intended to be a very quick visual representation um, of the part of the process that we're in with all of these different modules. So a lot of the analysis has been done. Um, and in combination with working with SIG, reviewing other systems. Of course, we have a lot of business analysts, designers, developers, uh, and testers working on these, this section of the product. A lot of them with stacks, some of them with other organizations, and of course, the SIGs and the small group contributing tons of time, helping us with analysis and design and refinement of all these designs as we're moving forward through the process. So you can see that the, the module that's farthest forward, the module that's actually in the folio testing environment already, um, so it exists with all of the other modules that folks are developing from around the world, is our vendor module. Uh, the next one to be included in there will be uh, the finance module. So we're still working on some aspects of this finances module before adding it to testing, but it's coming up right away. And then we'll be working or focusing primarily on orders. Uh, and then, of course, receiving as a part of that, uh, invoicing, eventually payments and credits to tie all those things together. So this is very high level, um, a representation of where we're at in the process with all these different things. Now it's time for a quick demonstration. So to show you some of the software actually working, all these hours upon hours of work that have gone in, uh, and all of the hours of work that we have still remaining to do. We're all getting very excited because we finally are getting to see a lot of these different systems interacting with each other. And a lot of the work that we've done coming together in real software. So I'm gonna give you just a very brief look because uh, I wanna leave as much time for questions as we possibly can. And Dennis, we've got 22 minutes. Perfect, yeah, it'll be very quick, snap, uh, snapshot of what we're doing here, but I need to share the appropriate. Uh, let's do. Yeah, what I need to do first is that. How's everything looking now? Can people see? Yes, I've got a vendor. I see a vendor screen. Excellent. So we've already logged into the system here. Um, and again, we're looking at a very rough interface. This is, this is a testing environment that we're using internally. Um, this vendors module, like I said, has already been added to the overall or the larger testing box um, that folks are working on that includes all the other modules. So here, the only modules you're seeing are things that we're developing here at Stacks. Um, but we're in vendors here and you can see we can search or filter by our active vendors, pending, combination of those things. When we click on a vendor, we see the vendor record beside here. I've got too many things on my screen, so I'm having trouble. Let me just get that out of the way. Let me just get you out of the way. There you go. Um, you can see this vendor records coming to life here and we can expand <clears throat> to see all the potential details here that we have for a specific vendor. We can also edit that vendor record. And that's gonna give us the ability to make changes to all these different areas of information. We can add multiple addresses. We can add multiple can contact people vendor information, the EDI information, <clears throat> and all these different things, excuse me. Then we can obviously update that vendor record. So we're seeing a lot of 
our basic create, update, you know, view and delete uh, for these things for vendors. And then we have the finance module coming together. And I'd mentioned, you know, in finances, we have ledger, fund, and budget. And we also have the concept of fiscal year that relates to all three of those things. So here we can look at the different records, the ledger record, the fund record, budget record, uh, and the different fiscal years that exist in the system at the moment. And the format is very similar. We've got our search and filter, uh, where as this evolves, we're going to see different facet filters here that we can use to find the ledgers we're looking for, the funds, the budgets, and uh, this interface will evolve. And I think that's probably all we need to show given our time constraints. So let's turn it over to the next slide. And I'll hand it over to Anne-Marie. And I'll unmute and I'll stop answering questions. Um, so acquisitions uh, is kind of like circulation in that it, it, um, it interacts with lots of other pieces of folio. And a lot of times the, the way a new resource is entering the system is through an acquisitions process. Um, you need something for a course, uh, you get a request from a selector or a faculty member, and now you need to acquire that thing, whether it's an electronic thing or a physical thing, um, or even for gifts if, if you're creating order records to, to start the process of bringing gift materials into your collection. So, we obviously cannot develop the acquisitions portion of Folio in a vacuum when compared to the rest of Folio. So this is just to give you a little bit of a feel for the other pieces of Folio that acquisitions is going to need to be able to interact with and integrate with. Kristen mentioned the ERM group that is uh, just starting work a few weeks ago. And one of the pieces that we don't have a good detailed understanding yet is what the relationship is going to be between the work that's happening in the ERM portion of Folio and the acquisitions portion of Folio. You have vendors um, who, when we talk about vendors and acquisitions, we tend to be talking about the people that you're paying money to, the people that you're ordering from and that you're paying your invoice to. Whereas uh, in ERM, it may be the platform provider that you're getting access to an electronic resource, who you've negotiated the license agreement with, so maybe a consortium perhaps that you're, you're getting a deal through, but then the access is coming from someplace else and you're paying your invoice to another entity. So what is the relationship between all those organizations that might have uh, something to do with electronic resources that, that the library is acquiring and working with? Same thing when it comes to the financials, the licenses, um, the, the resource over time and things like cost per use data for electronic resources. We still need to work out what is the dividing line between ERM and acquisitions and how do we have them talk to each other most efficiently. For circulation and item records, um, Having the circulation data allows you for your physical materials to do things like calculate cost per use. Um, acquisitions, just like being the start of the cataloging process for many materials, is often the start of the item record process as well, especially if you're perhaps getting shelf ready services from your vendor. And so the vendor is sending materials uh, packaged with barcodes, with call numbers. And so you need all of that information updated in your items and in your holdings and your cataloging um, efficiently and automatically based on data coming from your vendor. That uh, cataloging data, the holdings and items data is all going to appear in the inventory area of Folio. And uh, if you are working with MARC records, there is a section of Folio that we haven't really talked much about yet. It's going to be called MARC Cat, though, which is where you're going to be able to do the editing of the MARC record portion. And then those will surface in the inventory area. 
since a lot of our processes are still very focused on moving MARC records around with all kinds of data in them, there is a piece of folio that we are just starting work on, which is the MARC batch loader, which will be used heavily by cataloging, but also by acquisitions to be able to take incoming data and break it into the pieces that will create the instances, holdings, and items in inventory and the orders and acquisitions. So we're just starting work on that. Dennis mentioned tags and the tags development is underway. The tags are gonna be used not only in the, the various acquisitions records that Dennis was showing you, but are gonna be available for any type of records and transactions in Folio. So if you wanna assign tags to users or to uh, any of the inventory records, you'll be able to do that. And of course, what is acquisitions without reporting? We live for Excel and reports and numbers and, and money. So all of the work that we do is going to have to be able to be consumed by the folio reporting functionality and uh, made available, uh, most likely in relation to a lot of this other data so that you can get meaningful reports out of folio. And one of the other things that we're excited about, um, for me, I, I love building this, uh, this basic part of Folio because I, I live for acquisitions. But the, the more exciting part, I think, is going to be after we get basic acquisitions out of the way, what are the cool things that Folio can allow us to do? And I know this is what gets people like Sebastian really excited. Um, I, I am happy if I can just pay an invoice sometimes, but, um, but obviously having the ERM and acquisitions integrated well into one system hopefully is gonna make it so that we can do more interesting things and more efficient things with the data between ERM and acquisitions than we have previously. Um, one thing that comes up for me with libraries sometimes is we have this very efficient workflow around shelf-ready physical items, but the last step, kind of the shelf-ready step for electronic resources tends to be lighting them up in the holdings tool or the knowledge base that underpins a library's discovery layer. And in some cases, that can be a fairly efficient process. In other cases, it can be a horrible manual lookup process that uh, when, you're, when you're maybe acquiring 200 new resources a week is not a sustainable thing to do manually. So ideally, that could become a more automated process within Folio. Subscription renewals, everybody's, uh, most everybody has large subscription lists. And uh, right now, a lot of that work gets done in uh, your subscription agent system, and then you flip over to your local system and then copy a lot of that information so that you eventually can get a subscription renewal invoice that is able to be processed. It would be awfully nice if we could get that to be a more integrated process between the, the vendor, the subscription agent system, and Folio. So many of our acquisitions processes rely on moving EDI files around, whether it's orders, invoices, claims, claim responses. Uh, for some of the internationals, quotes are an important message and or moving MARC files around for order data, for cataloging data, shelf-ready data. But those are batch, uh, sometimes they're overnight processes. And we haven't taken a lot of advantage of real-time APIs yet in acquisitions. I think part of that is because we just have these legacy uh, processes and they work, and so it's, uh, it, it takes time and energy to rip those out and try something new. But we have an opportunity. We, we have an opportunity with Folio. We have an opportunity with how APIs are evolving to try to get away from batch processes and more toward real-time processes that are in newer formats than some of these uh, very old formats, and frankly, that we've jammed a lot of information into, particularly when it comes to the MARC records. Anything involving external systems, whether it's your vendor systems, your university financial systems, course management systems, um, the, the possibilities are endless, and we need to 
um, make sure that Folio can integrate well with them uh, for acquisitions purposes, for collection development purposes, for um, uh, analytics and um, uh, uh, metrics that are used to justify library budgets. And so uh, having Folio, having it be uh, an app-based uh, system, I think is going to allow interesting experimentation for different libraries to uh, think about new and interesting ways to connect to external systems. One of the things Kristen's very heavily involved with is workflow analysis and modeling. So having a way to have an application that helps us with um, uh, routinizing workflows with uh, knowing what the next step is going to be and having the system help you to push that uh, thing to the next step, whether it's negotiating a license agreement or moving an order along a process, um, having dashboards for users that show them their work for the day, um, being able to share best practices and share workflows. I found I can get this uh, term stricken from this clause by having this conversation with this person at this publisher, um, being able to share those best practices, or this is how I answer this particular um, uh, question on this accreditation statistics that I have to fill out. This is the report that I use to get that number. Um, being able to share those practices across the community, I think are all gonna be important things that Folio is going to help us to do better and to do in more interesting ways as we move forward. So last but not least. Yes. Are you doing this one, Dennis, or me? I forget. Uh, you go ahead. You're All right. Well. So um, the just a, a few links for you. And again, this is recorded. And so you'll have all of this. Um, our small group, the, the acquisition subgroup is that second link where it says documentation is available at the prototypes uh, are uh, Dennis has the link here. Know that the prototypes are in a tool that is being um, replaced by another tool. So the prototypes are not always the current way that the that particular module looks, and it's not always the um, uh, the final way that that module is going to look. But it is a good starting point. And there are uh, contacts on the acquisition subgroup page for all of us who are in the subgroup if you have questions, if you look at those prototypes. And then a really important channel for us is the discuss area, particularly since we are an international group and we have people at all different time zones. Not everyone can make it to the resource management SIG meetings that are on Friday mornings, uh, US Eastern time, and very early for Dennis on, uh, on the Western side of Canada. So the discuss posts are where we put um, we sometimes will put prototypes up there. We'll sometimes put questions up there that, that we have that we want to get more feedback or more thoughtful feedback than maybe you can have in a meeting with lots of people. And so uh, if you look in Discuss, there are tags for the posts that relate to resource management that can bring you to uh, interesting discussions sometimes and you can add your thoughts and you can also ask questions and discuss and uh, start new topics there. So I think, I think that's it for the PowerPoint, huh Dennis? That's it, yeah, now questions. Um... So our presenters have done a great job going through um, and answering questions in the Q and A uh, box. Uh, if you have any other questions, please put them in now. I think we have about five, six minutes to go. Um, I'll go back and we've been answering in the Q&A box, but Eric pointed out that we didn't, uh, if folks are particularly in a group, they may or may not have, um, they may or may not have access to see all the Q&A. So, so I guess we can start running through those. Yeah, I'm just going to look quickly through. PO lines are clickable. 
right. And yes, if you are clicking on a PO or if you're in a PO and you have a PO line, you'll be able to drill down into the details of each PO line. <clears throat> Um, we talked a bit about exchange rates, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to do more on exchange rates. We talked about connecting to external systems. There's been a little bit of conversation about go, uh, going on about claims, and we're intending to support claims, but in the grand scheme of everything that Folio acquisitions needs to do, <clears throat> excuse me, we decided that claims are not our first priority. First priority is placing orders, paying invoices, setting up vendors, setting up your funds. Um, until we have claims, you'll need to work with your vendor systems. You will be able to filter on, you know, what are my oldest orders that I haven't received yet to get a feel for, here's the things I need to be claiming. Um, you'll be able to add notes into the records when you've made claims, but having a, a function that generates claims out of folio or receives claim responses is not in the first iteration. Um, fiscal years, I think Dennis mentioned, we can, you can vary the fiscal year. That's one of the things you'll condition in your particular setup. And if you have ledgers, uh, if you have a, a campus that has a different fiscal year from another campus, which we have found some libraries do, um, then you can have different ledgers relate to different fiscal years. Uh, someone asked about uh, serial check-in with prediction patterns. Um, we do you think that there will be prediction patterns? Um, our, our understanding is prediction patterns are getting a little less important as libraries move from physical to E for, for so many serials, but definitely something that, that libraries has flagged, have flagged as being important. And Marie, we just received a couple of new questions if you want to go through those. Um, one of them is, is it possible to apply multiple payments for a single item? such as an original payment, then the rate adjustment that comes much later on a different invoice. Definitely. Um, so we, uh, a couple different scenarios, we, you may have a $50,000 package that you're going to pay for over the course of three years. <clears throat> so you would be able to, you know, pay for it in installments or you get, uh, you get the invoice and then you get an upcharge later on. So yes, definitely. Yeah, and we, we got a question about the relationship between acquisitions and um, electronic resources management. For example, if you're ordering a database and um, it's from a particular vendor, are you going to be able to see all those relationships? Um, the answer is that's our plan. So we just had a, a meeting for me this morning at um, 7 a.m. Uh, with our ERM subgroup, which is actually mostly based in Europe at this point. Um, and we were talking about some of the different types of scenarios for purchasing and what the different, um, what the data model needs to be to support that. And this is, you know, one of the things that we're working through. So some of it is just like, what terminology do we want to use to describe these kind of hierarchical or interrelated packages, um, but the, the vendor or the organization with whom we're doing business, whether they're to whom we pay, to who's hosting the content, or, you know, a consortia that's kind of like a pass-through, all those relationships need to be represented within the ERM, and, and we were recognizing that. So we got a question is, can we encumber funds without creating, whoops. Sorry, um, yeah. can, can I create? Is, yes, you could. I'm not sure. Oh, what wait, exactly I did it wrong then. <laughs> so I'm not, yeah, because I'm not sure you, what you mean exactly by encumber funds, but you can create a payment or a credit manually. Uh, so you could go to a fund, you know, that has a specific budget and you could create a payment. You could possibly create a payment that is distributed across multiple funds that doesn't necessarily have a purchase order associated with it. Um, if you if you're encumbering Dennis, where you don't you haven't paid yet, but you're gonna pay, um, is there a way to reflect those that I'm gonna pay without a purchase order? That I'm gonna pay without a purchase order, and I just want to encumber there. 
there's no reason why we couldn't do that because a transaction is a transaction and it exists in a state. So if we allow you to, to indicate that the state is just encumbered and not yet paid, um, presumably, I guess, because you're going to receive an invoice and you want to mark the transaction or the payment as now actually expended only once you've received the invoice and then generated a payment for it. Um, so that one, that one may be a little more tricky because you'd have to create the payment and then receive the invoice, relate the invoice to the payment so that it actually updates the correct payment or the correct receipt and moves it through the process. Um, so that's, that's an interesting one that I think maybe we need to take away because the system wouldn't prevent us from doing that. I think the user experience of doing that right now is a bit clunky. So thanks very much for that question. We'll definitely take that away. Right. Date formats, there is an internationalization piece for uh, Folio that applies not just to acquisitions, but across all of Folio that allows you to um, uh, uh, do the dates in the format that you're accustomed to. Um, also, that applies to currencies where you have, uh, in some parts of the world, currencies that don't have decimals. Um, ideally, currencies where, it, in some parts of the world, commas and periods are, um, or full stops, whatever you're calling them, are opposite to each other. So the, the internationalization aspect of Folio should allow you to customize it to the, uh, to the way that your part of the world expresses uh, currencies, uh, dollar or amounts in currencies, and dates and times. So I think we've hit the end of our time. I just want to point out a couple of things and then we can kind of stick around and continue to answer questions if that works for Anne-Marie and Dennis and Kristen. Uh, but the recording of today's forum will be posted to the openlibraryenvironment.org website. The next Folio Forum is scheduled for May 16th and it's going to be on the topic of GoKB. There will also be live streaming coming out of the upcoming WolfCon uh, Folio community meeting, which starts on May 7th. So keep an eye on Twitter, the folio.org blog, and the Folio newsletter for details. Uh, thank you to our speakers, Kristen Martin, Anne-Marie Bro, and Dennis Bridges, and to everyone who's asked questions and added comments. And so if you guys want to stick around, we could, uh, our presenters can answer some more questions. And thanks, everybody. Great turnout. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you for having us. So Dennis and Kristen and everybody, I'm trying to grab the chat in the q a so i think um the host can do that after we are yeah i i end, save so. all of that stuff uh great no problem i mean if you want to do it you can do it but it'll be part of the the video yeah i'm not a trusting soul so so, so eric asked the most important question of the day which is what does the wolf from wolfcon how does it relate to the what does bees? that mean? Does How it does like it bees? They're not in the for a long time, actually. I would love to have that answer. Mm -hmm. We need well, to come up with a unified theme of wolves eating honey, maybe. Although that's really more a bear. It should be like bear con. Do, do, do wolves eat okapi, I guess, is another question. So, I don't think so. Oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't think they live on the same continent. No. I just can't wait to see the t-shirts that come out. Mm -hmm. Everyone who's still on as a participant. Is <laughs> <laughs> um, so WolfCon is the World Open Library Foundation Conference. Uh, okay. uh, I mean, and it was just something we needed to call it something, you know, shorter than that. I mean, I don't know that it was meant to be the name of it, but it just kind of stuck. So there you go. I like it. That's kind of true of so many things too, you know, like France. <laughs> like France? <laughs> Was France nameless until France? Well, you know, they were just joking around. We should call it France. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's not an easy way to copy and paste the Q&A. I copied the chat. So. Mike will get it for you though. Yeah. 
There were some great I, questions. The Q&A, you have to do it one at a time, it looks like. Yeah, there are pain. And the participant list, if it's got email addresses, that would be great, because there's a couple we should go back. Yeah, we always talk with them in more did all of that uh, to the speakers and to the facilitators group. Uh, the the list. Well, I'm sorry, I, my wrapping things up just killed all the killed well, the it is, No, 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 it's good. It's fine. people have been on for 90 minutes. Heck. Yeah, it's a long <clears> one. Yeah. yeah, it was an incredible uh, interactive session. I mean, a lot of questions and a lot of very specific questions. People get a little hung up on things that perhaps aren't the most difficult technical <laughs> issues. Mm -hmm. but. So I think we're good. And Dennis, you did a great job getting all yeah, of that you. summarized. It's really nice to actually see how much is there after all those meetings. So. Isn't it crazy though? You're kind of going uh, through it. Whenever you go through it at that high level and you look back and you're like, wow, man, we have done a ton of work here. And not a lot, lot, lot of time. No. And I, I have 65 meetings that we have notes for and I probably have a dozen meetings that I didn't ever get the notes pulled together. So we're definitely in the 70s for meetings. Yeah, it's... it's but it's 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 paid off. I mean, the yeah. amount of detail you collected like has made the implementation process a little smoother from our end too. So it's all good work, and there's still there's still a chunk left to be done. That's the crazy part. <laughs> but we're having fun. Yep. It's funny you get started with going through all the different modules, and there's always more that you want to say. Right. Like at the time you're thinking, okay, well, what's, is that that important or should we just move on to the next thing? Um, I don't know. So I hope people got a good bit of perspective. I think so. Yeah. And so we will get these questions. We'll yes. have a copy of these questions. Okay. Yes. Or else we all go to Mike's house with uh, pitchforks. So. <laughs> Cause yeah, there are a few that I think we should bring to the small group and just Chat Definitely. Sure. Yep. Um, that whole thing about payments, well, encumbrances and payments without relating to an order. I want to talk through that some more because I, likewise, uh, I don't, I, ha I don't, I have to figure out how to see it. are for that yeah. too, exactly. Um, yeah. And then the biggest, the biggest thing that still is this giant question mark for me is the ERM acquisitions connections and what's, what goes where. So, well, you probably, um, or maybe you haven't. There, there have been some emails today about the WolfCon ERM um, work. So, yeah, um, I guess yeah, you've been CC'd on them. Yeah, I just so, haven't had a chance. Yeah. Yes, um, but anyway, I think that will. I feel like we are um, going to have an opportunity to talk in some detail about that. So, yeah. good. All right. All right. What if we call you. it a day? Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank thanks, y'all. Take care. Bye. Talk to y'all soon. Bye.